Education, safety, operations, and innovation will come to order. I want to welcome everyone to our hearing today, addressing close calls to improve aviation safety. This may be the most important hearing we have all year, and I want to thank Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, and Ranking Member Moran for their help in making this hearing happen. The near misses we've been seeing recently are not normal. They are a warning that our aviation system is under stress. And today, we will have an opportunity to hear from several key stakeholders about why we are experiencing so many near misses and what we need to do to increase our safety margins. We will hear from National Transportation Safety Chairwoman Jennifer Homendy, FAA Air Traffic Organization Chief Operating Officer Tim Arell, National Air Traffic Controller Association President Rich Santa, Airline Pilots Association President Jason M Captain Jason Ambrosi, and former FAA Administrator Randy Babbitt. While disagreements tend to garner more coverage than compromise, it's worth noting that I remain proud of the bipartisan FAA Reauthorization Act that we introduced together, and I remain committed to finding a path forward to passage. Since in my non-biased, purely objective opinion, the Cantwell crew stuck with Moran Senate bill is far superior to the House alternative. Of course, safety must always come first, and that is why I say this may be the most important aviation hearing we hold this year. Our nation is experiencing an aviation safety crisis. Near misses are happening way too frequently, and I refuse to be complacent in waiting to act until the next runway incursion becomes a fatal collision. A wave of retirements and buyouts drained valuable experience from the United States aviation system, and coupled with a surge in demand, created essentially a perfect storm that's eroded the system's safety margins down to dangerously thin levels. In far too many near misses, the difference between a close call and a deadly disaster has depended on a single individual taking emergency action along with some good luck. According to the New York Times, in a recent 12-month period, there were 300 accounts of near collisions involving commercial carriers. That's almost one near miss per day so far. And I think we've got some images behind us here. The darker image behind me is a still picture from a video recorded by an individual riding in the jump seat of a JetBlue Flight 206 while landing at Boston Logan Airport. It shows a hop a jet charter flight crossing the runway they are about to land on and reveals how JetBlue 206 came within 400 feet of the charter flight crossing from left to right in front of them while taking off from an intersecting runway. Despite despite that uh, hop jet charter flight receiving explicit instructions to line up and wait. Fortunately, Logan Airport, Airport had installed a surface detection equipment that notified air traffic control um, when the charter flight began its unauthorized takeoff role. And this layer of safety was critical in empowering the controller to provide JetBlue 206 with the go-around instructions that averted disaster. Unfortunately, that very same month at Austin Bergstrom International Airport, we witness how the lack of critical surface detection equipment drastically increases the risk of a catastrophe. In that incident, a controller working on an overtime shift cleared FedEx 767 to land on a runway that Southwest, that is Southwest um, 737 had been cleared to take off from. It was foggy in the early hours and the controller could neither see the runway with their own eyes nor use ground radar to track the location of the 737 which was still on the runway as the large 767 descended through the clouds. Words fail to adequately describe how close 131 souls came to dying that day. The following animation demonstrates what it looks like when a 767 comes within 100 feet of a landing 737. Here it comes. These two aircraft came within 100 feet of another. And ATC did not see how close those came, and it was the pilot who called for the go-around and, and, and initiated his own go-around and told the um, other aircraft uh, uh, that he notified the other aircraft um, uh, that he that they almost came in contact with one another and the air traffic controller never saw it But the air traffic controller had also was on an overtime shift Unfortunately the near misses keep happening last month an Alaska Airlines flight executive 
an Alaska Airlines flight executing a go-round in Portland, Oregon, veered into the flight path of a SkyWest flight taking off from a parallel runway. The FAA, Congress, and the aviation industry must treat these near misses as, a precur as precursor events that, left unchecked, will eventually result in a deadly catastrophe. We have many layers of safety in our aviation system. The first layer is the pilot controller readback. The second layer is all the airport designs and markings. Next is the runway safety lights that turn red when the runway is active, alerting a crossing pilot to not cross. In ideal situations, the fourth layer is a ground radar tool. And of course, the last line of defense lies with the flight crew, especially the captain and first officer. Despite multiple layers of safety, far too many near misses have come down to the last line of defense. And bottom line, a system that repeatedly forces pilots into taking emergency evasive actions to save lives is either a broken system or one that is overwhelmed by new risks. Such new risk could be the result of aggregate loss of experience that has forced the industry to confront a workforce that overall is less, is, is less experienced, from pilots to controllers to technicians and other personnel. It appears that we've been fortunate to have experienced pilot to have experienced pilots in many of these instances who prevented a close call from becoming a disaster. But continuing to count on such good fortune is neither sustainable nor responsible. I hope we'll hear more about this from our witnesses. But one thing we already know, now is not the time to weaken or water down the post-Koken era of safety uh, post-Koken era safety system. Now is the time to strengthen it. This includes prioritizing one of the most vital pillars of our aviation safety system, air traffic control. Look, every air traffic controller has the privilege and pressure of working in a role that is inherently stressful, even on a good day. But that reality is no excuse for our current status quo, which forces controllers to regularly work 60-hour weeks because an estimated 99% of airports are understaffed, in addition to many airports lacking important runway safety technology. As both a pilot and a passenger, I refuse to accept a status quo that places the lives of our constituents in the hands of civil servants who are overworked and utterly exhausted. More than a decade ago, the FAA established new pilot rest and crew rest established a new pilot rest and crew less rule. This action aligned with the growing body of knowledge demonstrating that optimizing human performance requires optimizing rest and recovery. And when it comes to optimizing performance, the stakes could not be higher for ATC. FAA prioritizes the problem of fatigue controllers, and Congress must invest in these critical American workers to ensure that ATC staffing levels are sufficient to end, once and for all, the era of forcing controllers to regularly work 60 hours per week, and often without the benefit of vital safety technology and tools. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how we can work together to enhance safety and get our margins back to where they need to be. I now recognize Ranking Member Moran for his opening statement. Uh, Chair Duckworth, thank you very much. Thank you for convening this hearing. Thank you for your cooperation and working with me and others to see that the, this subcommittee and this full committee accomplishes its uh, task in regard to aviation. Um, the FAA manages uh, one of the world's most complex aviation systems, in fact, the most complex aviation system. It oversees more than 45,000 flights a day and almost 3 million airline passengers. Safety is so important, but it is an evolving process and we must continually reevaluate our system to make sure we have the most safe possible in, in play. We must determine how to prevent serious incidents like runway incursions and near misses, so I'm pleased to, to join you in having this hearing. We also need to ensure that these incidents are not indicative of a larger underlying issue. We know that demand for commercial aviation is expected to grow and uh, we have new entrants into our airspace. FAA is directly involved in PACs of $1.5 million, $1 million jobs and $1.5 trillion in GDP uh, in the world's economy. Our job is to determine the pressure points on our system now so that we can be ready to meet the demands not only today but in the future. Dangerous incidents also further highlight the need for Congress to pass FAA reauthorization. I was pleased and certainly agree with you that we have uh, a bill that is worthy of uh, action by the full committee. Uh, and consideration by the United States Senate. Uh, so I am anxiously awaiting that to occur uh, and look forward to working to see that it does. Earlier, we were successful in confirming a new FAA administrator, one, in my view, one of the most important tasks that uh, we could do and certainly one of the basic roles of the United States Senate. And so I'm pleased the administration nominated and the United States Senate uh, confirmed uh, a new FAA admi administrator that we look forward to working with and have faith uh, that he will perform his tasks well. 
uh, I do hope that we get out of the uh, series of reauthorizations that we've had in years past, and I look forward to a long-term reauthorization of the FAA. The FAA, in my view, is at a critical juncture. Perhaps that could be said at many times in our country's history, but we face many challenges, and the FAA is uh, front and center. We ought to do everything in our power to ensure the United States remains a leader in aerospace inno innovation. But, with, but we, in everything that we do, we do it safely. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, Senator Moran. I will now turn it over to um, Main Committee Chairwoman Cantwell for her opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Chair Duckworth, and thank you uh, to Senator Moran for this important hearing. I, I can't think of two people better prepared to lead the safety charge and aviation charge on our committee than the two of you. So thank you for doing this hearing. And I so agree with both of your comments. I think you outlined exactly why we're here this morning, that it is a, a constant task to be on top of innovation and safety and competitiveness. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here, too, because I think that they are uh, very illuminating of the challenges we faced in the past and how we met them and what we need to do today. So I thank all of them for that. Uh, the Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act outlined some new ways in which we could improve safety. One of those was to basically say that we should have a trend report every year to better listen to some of the safety trends. This hearing this morning is really a reflection of that. It is about what trend we're seeing now and why we want to do more to fix it. So I want to applaud the NTSB for their leadership on this particular issue of near misses. I think that they have sounded the alarm, and I think you are sounding it again today. And it's one of the reasons why, as Senator Moran said, we need to get an FAA authorization bill, because it has some tools in that bill that will help us meet this challenge. First and foremost, uh, uh, NTSB Director Hamidi basically is saying in her testimony, for controllers, we have cited staffing shortages, which lead to scheduling issues, fatigue, laugh, lack of, of or deficient supervisory oversight, distraction, ineffective scanning, and the need for value-added training. Well, that's a, uh, in quote there, a summation of her testimony. That is why we need the additional FAA air traffic controllers that are in the FAA bill of over 3,000 people to help us meet this balance. We cannot have people working six days a week. We need people who have the ample amount of rest and capability to deal with, as my colleague Senator Duckworth said, probably one of the most stressful and challenging jobs there is. Secondly, um, I think Ms. Hamadi also outlines correctly the important attributes of the Air Surface Detection Equipment Program, ASDEX, which is a ground radar and electronic technology that allows controllers to track surface movement of aircraft and vehicles. And in the airports where we have this technology, guess what? Things have worked well. The areas where we haven't, uh, this is why we need this legislation, because we are authorizing $18.2 billion to make sure that um, all of our large and mid-sized airports have this technology and have this technology deployed. So I'm sure we're going to hear other uh, comments this morning and other answers, but two of them lie right in front of us, and I'm with Senator Moran. We should get this job done and continue to move forward. Um, I'm a believer, as he is, that aviation is going to continue to grow, and we want it to, and that the international competition is also going to be there. So we have to lead, get it right, and demonstrate that we have the capacity to grow in the future and to get it to be the safest system in the world. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair, again for this important hearing. Um, thank you. Um, Senator Cruz is not currently here. He's the ranking member of the main committee. We will reserve time for him to uh, give his opening remarks when he does uh, attend. Um, in, in the meantime, we will go ahead with witness testimonies. Uh, I would like to uh, go ahead and recognize uh, Ms. Jennifer Homedy, Chairwoman of the National Transportation Safety Board, for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Chair Duckworth, and thank you, Senator Moran and Senator Cantwell, for leading on this issue and for having me here today. I want to start by emphasizing our incredible safety record. We have the safest airspace in the world, period. 
The critical efforts of everyone in this room have contributed to our reputation as the world's gold standard for aviation safety. We have a lot to be proud of, but we can make aviation safer. As you can see from this chart, there were 23 serious runway incursions in FY23, up from 16 in FY22 and 11 a decade ago. Runway incursions are also happening at a faster rate over the last decade. That's all runway incursions and the most serious. While these events are incredibly rare, our safety system is showing clear signs of strain that we cannot ignore. The NTSB has opened investigations into seven runway incursions this year alone. In over half, the aircraft got within several hundred feet of each other. We also opened an investigation into a runway collision between two business jets that occurred two weeks ago in Houston. Combined, these events put more than 1,300 lives at risk. That's on top of three wrong surface landings that we investigated. Thankfully, no one was hurt or seriously injured in any of these incidents, but they could have been. It only takes one. It only takes one missed warning to become a tragedy, one incorrect response to destroy public confidence in a system that has been built over decades. These incidents must serve as a wake-up call before something more catastrophic occurs. This isn't the first time we've seen this. We issued this same warning in 2007, and we issued the same warning after the 2017 incident at SFO, where an A320 came close to colliding with an A340 and three other airliners on a taxiway. The incident aircraft flew over the A340 at an altitude of 60 feet before it began climbing, which resulted in only 10 to 20 feet of vertical separation. All told, more than 1,000 people on the taxiway that day were at imminent risk of serious injury or death. I know you're gonna at, want to talk about our open investigations and get details on those. The NTSB is incredibly careful to gather all the facts and evidence around an incident before drawing conclusions or making safety recommendations. While I cannot discuss the details of our open investigations, I can share a few things, a few of what we're seeing. In the wake of the pandemic, we're experiencing a massive resurgence of air traffic. But we're also seeing significant ATC shortages, resulting in mandatory overtime, fatigue, distraction, and less opportunity for meaningful value-added training. On the flight deck, fatigue and distraction are leading to deviations from federal aviation regulations. Across the entire industry, we have a newer workforce who need training and mentorship. And we're seeing people that are struggling with significant mental health challenges. All of this is compounded by a lack of technology to ensure redundancy and protect against human error. Redundancy is the foundation of our stellar aviation safety record. It has served as the model for preventing accidents and crashes in all other modes of transportation. All that's to say, the current strain on our aviation system and its workforce cannot be underestimated. Before I close, I wanna thank all of you for being staunch supporters of the NTSB. But now I need your help. The NTSB needs the resources to carry out our vital safety mission. We received $145 million in the President's FY24 budget, which is included in the House mark. The Senate is at $134.3 million. We need the Senate to match that number of 145. Our agency's staffing and funding levels have remained somewhat stagnant since 1997. The small increases have gotten to well-deserved pay increases for our staff. But since I've become chair, we've accomplished a lot. We've eliminated our backlog entirely. We've boosted staffing, and we've made significant uh, investments in IT. Thank you for your continued support, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Hamadi. We now recognize Mr. Tim Morrell, Chief Operating Officer, FAA Air Traffic Organization. Thank you, Chair Duckworth. Thank you, Chair Cantwell and Ranking Member Moran. 
Thank you for the opportunity to um, testify along with my fellow professionals on an issue that has been referred to as close calls and near misses. I appreciate you holding this hearing for your continued oversight because transparency and a commitment to a continuous improvement are keys to improving aviation safety. You're familiar with the statistics. The U.S. aviation system, as Chair Hamadi said, is the safest in the world. There's not been a fatal crash involving a major U.S. airline since 2009, but in my 38 years of public service dedicated to aviation safety, I've come to understand that safety isn't a number or a static place. It is a journey of continuous improvement, eliminating risk before it becomes a statistic. Any significant event, whether isolated or indicative of a trend, is a concern and one we don't take lightly. One close call is one too many. Aviation safety is a team sport. Air traffic controllers, pilots, commercial operators, general aviation, and airports provide multiple layers of safety to protect the flying public. We have intentionally built in redundancies in our technologies and procedures where if one fails, the other one kicks in. Let me stress, the level of safety we currently have is only possible because of transparency and constant collaboration between the FAA and the users of the national airspace system. At the FAA, we're proact we are proud of our proactive safety culture, which means we value and encourage the sharing of data and safety information amongst the agency, industry, and labor to reduce risk, to learn from each other, and to collaboratively develop mitigations. The bottom line is that sharing and exchanging of safety information makes us safer and stronger. In fiscal year 2023, there were approximately 54 and a half million takeoffs and landings in the U.S., and there were 1,756 total runway incursions. It's important to note, as the NTSB has highlighted, the number of most serious runway incursions, those where a collision was narrowly avoided or there was significant potential for a collision, what we call categories A's and B's, was a total of 23. And back to my point about transparency, all this information is available to the public. However, even though significant runway incursions were only 1.3% of the total number of operations, any number is unacceptable. And we are earnestly pursuing the elimination of all significant safety events in the system. Our goal is zero significant safety events. Transparent and collaborative reporting revealed an uptick in the most significant events early, and the FAA immediately responded through the administrator's call to action and other initiatives. A safety summit that was held in March of 2023 brought together more than 200 safety leaders from across the aviation industry, including labor representatives from NACA, ALPA, and PASS, to discuss ways to enhance flight safety. NTSB Chair Hamandy spoke there as well, and that's where we committed to a goal of zero significant safety events. This is the same collaborative approach that was, vir that was used to virtually eliminate the risk of fatalities aboard U.S. commercial airlines. The FAA has held a number of surface safety summits with individual users of our national airspace system, such as general aviation, air carriers, business aviation, and airport operators. We hear a lot about technology solutions, and those are certainly key. We are fast-tracking technologies to address specific safety concerns on the airport surface and are deploying a surface awareness technology at those locations that currently do not have a surface surveillance system. The trend overall is going down, but it's not enough. As I stressed at the beginning of my testimony, while we are proud of our safety culture and the progress we have made, we do not have the luxury of complacency. We are optimistic that our ongoing work in collaboration with industry and labor will continue to lead to greater safety improvements. The FAA will remain vigilant and continue collaborating with everyone that utilizes the national airspace system to enhance safety with a goal of eliminating significant safety events. Going forward, Zero has to be the only acceptable number. Thank you again for the chance to speak on this critical issue, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. Arrell. I now recognize Mr. Rich Santa, President, National Air Traffic Controller Association, for five minutes. Chair Duckworth, Ranking Member Moran, Chair Cantwell, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. The most important action Congress can take for the safety of the national airspace system would be to pass a long-term comprehensive FAA reauthorization bill before the end of this year that directs the FAA to adopt a controller staffing target that has been developed by the Collaborative Resource Workgroup as the basis for the FAA's controller workforce plan and to maximize controller hiring for the duration of that bill. 
There are over 1,000 fewer controllers today than there were a decade ago. Continuing to follow the same flawed model that the FAA utilizes after more than a decade of missed hiring goals and missed staffing projections will continue this downward trend. A new approach is desperately needed. The FAA must adopt the updated and more accurate operational staffing targets that were jointly developed by the Collaborative Resource Workgroup. They were developed in, by a team comprised of the FAA's Air Traffic Organization and NACA, and FAA MITRE Corporation Center for Advanced Aviation System Development verified and validated that group's work. The facility staffing targets that the FAA utilizes today in our facilities were developed almost a decade ago. It's beyond time to update them. The new CRWG staffing targets need to be used as the basis for the FAA's annual controller workforce plan, moving forward so that Congress and aviation industry have a complete and most importantly accurate picture and view of the staffing needs of the NAS. We appreciate the Commerce Committee's inclusion of the CRWG staffing targets in its draft reauthorization bill. Under staffing, the FAA requires mandatory overtime to our control workforce, including regular six-day work weeks and 10-hour days. This leads to fatigue. Last year's controller, controllers at 40% of our facilities worked six-day work weeks at least once a month, and several of our facilities require six-day work weeks and 10-hour days every single week. Air traffic control is already a highly stressful profession. Working 200 hours per month layers on significant fatigue and inserts additional risks into the NAS. In fact, in June, the DOT Inspector General issued an audit concluding that while the United States has one of the safest air traffic systems in the world, the lack of fully certified controllers poses a potential risk to air traffic operations. To reach the CRWG staffing targets, the FAA must hire to the maximum throughput of the FAA Academy for more than just the next five years. We are thankful for the bipartisan group of senators who have co-sponsored the important Air Traffic Controller Hiring Act of 2023, which we believe should be included in the base reauthorization bill. The FAA also needs to be transparent with its need for increased funding for its facilities and equipment budget, which provides resources for physical infrastructure repairs and sustainment, equipment modernization, and major capital projects. Congress has always met the agency's stated need, but the FAA has consistently requested less than it needs. It hasn't even adjusted for inflation. This has prevented the agency from meeting its equipment sustainment replacement and modernization needs, resulting in a significant backlog. Moving to a fix-on-fail model has led the, the FAA's inability to maintain and replace critical safety equipment that has exceeded ex its expected life and introduced unnecessary risk into the system. The failure of the U.S. NOTAM system earlier this year, resulting in a shutdown of the airspace, was a glaring example of this risk. Funding limitations have also delayed the FAA from de designing and implementing new technology to improve safety, such as the airport surface surveillance situational awareness tools that are so desperately needed to address runway incursions, a top safety concern. NACA is supportive of the Senate's T-HUD appropriations bill because along with the funding from the Infrastructure, Investment, and Jobs Act, it will meet the FAA needs this year. Finally, I want to stress the need to avoid a government shutdown that would force the FAA to suspend hiring, close its training academy, delay the pipeline of new controllers, delay modernization, which would be a catastrophic impact to the national airspace system. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to your questions. Five minutes exactly. I'm very impressed. Uh, that's an air traffic controller speaking right there. He's on the dot. Um, thank you, Mr. Santa. And I recognize Captain Ambrosi for his remarks. Thank you. I'm not sure I'll be quite so accurate as, as Rich was, but good morning. Thank you, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, Chair Duckworth, Ranking Member Moran, and members of the committee for holding this hearing. My name is Jason Ambrosi. I'm an international captain on the Boeing 767 and president of the Airline Pilots Association International. 
It's an honor to testify today representing more than 77,000 airline pilots who fly for 42 airlines in the United States and Canada. I'd like to begin by thanking this committee and the entire committee for its commitment to keeping American aviation system the safest in the world. In the context of this extraordinary level of aviation safety that government, labor, and industry have achieved in the United States, recent near misses remind us that we can never let our guard down. From employees to procedures, there is a lot of new in the post-COVID air transportation system. We must do more, not less, to safeguard airline passengers, crews, and shippers. The success that we've achieved in the aviation system didn't happen by chance. Rather, it stems from decades of industry-wide industry work and commitment to collaboration, data collection and analysis, and hazard identification and mitigation. Our progress has also resulted from critical changes to regulations governing pilot qualification and training, fatigue, airline operations and maintenance, and technology. Airline pilots and other aviation employees are proud to play a critical role in aviation safety. Through voluntary safety reporting programs, we're the ones, often the only ones, to identify safety issues before they develop into accidents. The presence of two highly trained and well-rested pilots working on every airliner flight deck is another critical factor in safety. We saw this during the near-miss incident in Austin this past February. It could have resulted in tragedy were it not for the actions of the two FedEx pilots working on board that flight deck together. Such incidents make it clear that with demand returning more quickly than some anticipated, this is no time to reduce safety. Rather, these, these events compel us to strengthen safety through data collection efforts such as the Commercial Aviation Safety Team and technologies like NextGen. More work can and must be done to prevent near misses and other incidents. ALPA is calling for expanding the capabilities at more U.S. airports in areas including flight profile optimization, STARS remote surveillance displays, ADS-B out equipage, and NextGen equipage. ALPA strongly supports doing more to advance NextGen to enhance pilots and air traffic controllers' ability to pinpoint the position of aircraft while in flight and on the ground. Moving NextGen forward will not only help prevent near misses and enhance safety, but it will also improve traffic management and aircraft utilization, reduce flight delays, cut aviation emissions, and contribute to airline profitability. We commend the U.S. government for investing $26 million in new funding to install or replace legacy aviation systems with new technology to ensure that pilots and controllers benefit from the state-of-the-art runway, surveillance, and information. And we support the White House request for additional funding to extend these safety improvements to more U.S. airports. ALPA is committed to ensuring that all U.S. airports benefit from the same high level of safety regardless of size or location. This committee's bipartisan FAA Reauthorization Act of 2023 included provisions to enhance safety and prevent near-miss incidents. We thank you for your focus on these important safety advancements. Recently, there has understandably been heightened awareness of aviation workers' mental health. No one is more committed than ALPA to ensuring that airline pilots are fit for duty and have the support that they and all of us need when facing challenges. In 2024, ALPA will mark its 50th year of developing and implementing programs that support pilot mental health. Our work has set the standard for the global airline industry and is even used by other industries and countries. However, we as an industry must do more. We applaud this committee for addressing this issue in your 2023 reauthorization bill. This is a good start, and we stand ready to work with any stakeholder to make improvements in this critical area. Thanks to this committee and its commitment to collaborating with labor and other aviation stakeholders, U.S. air travel is extraordinarily safe. ALPA pilots are dedicated to protecting this nation's global leadership and moving forward to advance safety in our skies. Thank you. Not bad. Only you had an extra four seconds. <laughs> I now recognize uh, former FAA Administrator Randy Babbitt. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Duckworth and uh, Chair Cantwell and Vice Chair Ruman. Thank you for having me here today. 
Uh, I'm pleased to be speaking today with you, uh, with uh, folks from the FAA, the NTSB, and labor in general. And I was pleased to lead the FAA and ALPA in the past. I was a commercial airline pilot for a number of years. Uh, as ALPA president, I worked uh, back in the day with Administrator Henson to launch the FAA's Aviation Safety Action Program. We also secured one level of safety, and that's when we moved Part 135 operations and their regulations to comply with 121 operations. We all, at that point in time, we also required each of our ALPA pilot groups to establish and embrace professional standards. And as President Obama's uh, FAA administrator, I worked with the FAA safety professionals <clears throat> which had been, uh, we updated the pilot rest rules, which had been on the NTSB's most wanted list for about uh, two decades, so we got that done. We worked with carriers to implement the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing System. We advanced work with a commercial uh, <clears throat> aviation safety team, CAST, which reported in 2008 that the risk in fatal commercial accidents had been reduced by 83%. And all that work was done in conjunction and working together uh, with all the parties. However, in, uh, in mid-2009, I testified before this very committee <clears throat> after a tragic accident. And knowing we must do more to enhance aviation safety, I instituted a call to action urging unions to focus on professionalism and professional standards committees. We asked the carriers to adopt voluntary safety and data sharing programs. Data, when shared and act upon without fear and no retribution, is what makes us safe. And this remains critical, as it's clear that what got us here today is not a guarantee will take us into the future. <clears throat> a lack of accidents today is simply not a good predictor of future accidents. Our environment is changing, and recent coast calls and incursions are symptoms of strain. And I highly urge a strong refocus on professionalism, eliminating complacency if it can, and boosting crew resource management throughout our operations. And as our operating environment evolves, the training of our professionals has to advance with it. Flight simulators can be used in structured training courses to accurately recreate the experience of flight operations and a fully immersive experience, forcing pilots to encounter aircraft malfunctions, rare events like rapid uh, decompressions, emergency descents, high-speed rejected takeoffs, dual engine failures, severe icing conditions, flight control malfunctions, full stalls, and doing all of this without placing any lives in danger. Simulators also present the opportunity to incorporate actual accident and incident scenarios into training. Pilots should experience the factors that led to the accidents and learn how to successfully recover so that such accidents never happen again. The tools are here. It's backed by substantial data, and yet there's a hesitation to act. But the FOCA rule was never meant to be static. The Safety Act clearly directs that proper, quote, supplemental training may be used to offset flight time requirements when doing so brings us to a higher level of safety. And as knowledge and training techniques progress, additional training credit should be and should be well used to improve, <coughs> excuse me, both safety and skills. The FAA has followed up with two aviation rulemaking committees comprised of experts from across aviation, including ALPA, and the members of both ARCs have unanimously supported supplemental training and recommended a cur curriculum to replace simple flight hours with advanced training and mentoring. This guidance has not been implemented, and in my opinion, it should be. I'm not alone in saying this. Our current administrator has urged the adoption of modern training techniques like simulation. And earlier, I joined with eight former FAA administrators and two former ALPA presidents, I happen to be in both buckets, <clears throat> to urge the adoption of tested and trusted new technologies to strengthen air safety. We said in that letter, if scenario-based simulator training was a routine part of gaining 1,500 required, hours required for an ATP, we could require updating training and expose the kind of scenarios that have led to the recent rash of runway incursions and near misses. We also said, as pilot training and technology evolves, it's the responsibility of the FAA and policymakers to evolve with it. Well, that concludes my message today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Babbitt. I will now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, as you know well, um, addressing pilot fatigue was a high priority issue for the FAA under your leadership. Um, uh, in December of 2009, then FAA Associate Administrator 
uh, Margaret Peggy Gilligan testify before this very committee um, that, and I quote, we believe, this is quoting her, we believe that it is critical whether, whenever possible to incorporate scientific information on fatigue and human sleep physiology into re regulations on flight crew scheduling. Such scientific information can help to maintain the safety margin and promote optimum crew performance and alertness during flight operations. More importantly, FAA acted in late 2011 to publish new rules on pilot fatigue, which many, including the then chair of the NTSB, believe was a contributing factor to the deadly, tragic, and preventable Colgan crash that killed 50 people in early 2009. FAA's rules were common sense, limit the amount of time pilots can be on duty and pilot flight time, and implement a minimum requirement of rest before a duty day. Chair Hamandi, you recently stated, and I quote, when it comes to these recent high-profile aviation incidents, mistakes by air traffic control flight crews, or ground personnel are sometimes cited as a contributing factor. But is it really human error when 96% of your workplaces are exhausted and don't have adequate staffing? Chair Hamidi, is it time for FAA and Congress to re-examine and update rest rules that are tailored to optimize air traffic controller performance? Well, it, it isn't just the number of hours. It's the scheduling practices. And then if you're already short-staffed, then you have people who are working mandatory overtime, six days a week, 10 hour days. And then when you look at the schedule, it's a constantly rotating schedule. I have one from one event, uh, a schedule for a week from one event that, we, that we're currently investigating. We've got two evenings, a morning shift, another evening shift, uh, another morning shift, a day off, an evening. All of that uh, can impact your circadian rhythm. So, uh, and then wh where you end up with that is distraction, fatigue, you're missing things, you're forgetting things. Uh, that's all an impact. I feel like, you know, what was taken as the minimum amount of rest has now become the standard way that we schedule folks, and I don't think that that is sustainable. President Santa, could you share the air traffic controller workforce perspective on why rest rules are needed to better protect ATC crews and the flying public? Thank you for the question. It comes down to the redundancy and the resiliency of our staffing. We're so short-staffed in most or many of our facilities uh, that service air travel right now that we don't have the opportunity or the capacity to have uh, a five-day work week uh, with eight-hour days. Uh, the norm, like you said, keeping the system active, keeping the capacity at the level that it is expected to be, requires six-day work weeks and 10-hour days due to the fact the hiring FA's model of hiring and what they produce on the controller workforce plan Ex has exasperated the situation, resulting in a thousand fewer controllers in this elevated aviation uh, upturn. It's unsustainable and it needs to be changed through FA reauth because the FA has been unwilling to collaboratively uh, involve these, these new processes. Thank you. Um, if Congress's primary role in passing the Airline Safety Act of 2010 was to, re to prevent future Kogan area type disasters, one must recognize that it has been a success, starting with a 99.8% reduction in Part 121 fatalities since the enactment, um, since when the rules went into effect. We must never take the post Kogan safety system for granted, and that's why I strongly oppose tinkering with the 2010's law statutory requirements, including the 1500 hour rule. Now, I, as a, as a military pilot, I flew simulators, and I agree, if you have six degree of motion full immersion simulators, that is an immense tool and a very useful tool. Um, uh, uh, but I do think that if we just substitute some of the 1500 hours and just say structured simulator time, but don't specifically say what type of simulator, what kind of training that's gonna be. You can burn holes in the sky in a simulator just as well as you can burn holes in the sky in a 152. So I think we need to be clear when we say, let's talk about simulators, that we're talking about full motion, six degree, full immersion simulators and not Microsoft Flight Simulator sitting in a hotel ballroom someplace. Um, our safety management system protocols do not appear to be accounting for new risks in our system, and the aggregate of these risks, such as less experienced workforce and pervasive air traffic controlling control um, shortages. Mr. Ambrosi, at a time when we have a 737 and a 767 flying within 100 feet of each other, and every other month seems to bring new, a new chilling runway incursion or near miss, would you agree that the most prudent and safest course of action would be to add additional experience and training requirements rather than seeking to weaken the water down to 1500 hour rule? Well, thank you for the question. Absolutely, uh, it's an all of the above. You need that ex real world experience as well as better training. So it, it's, an, it's an all of the above. 
I do think that what we can do is, as you're trying to get to that 1500 hour rule, you sh we could break that down and say, you actually need a certain number of IMC hours, you need a certain number of uh, uh, um, you know, cross country hours and be very specific in that, um, which is what happens in the military, which is much more structured than um, their average person trying to get 50 to 1500 hours at the local FBO. Um, I am out of time, over time, and with that, I will recognize um, the ranking member Moran for his questions. Chairwoman, again, thank you. Uh, Mr. Santa, thank you for highlighting the importance of no shutdown. It ought to be evident, but uh, you outlined a number of serious things that uh, can and will happen uh, if we fail to come together. And, and again, while we're trying to get ahead of the problem, uh, this would put us behind the ball one more time. So uh, thanks for bringing that to, to our attention, to my attention. And we'll work to try to avoid any kind of gap in funding. Uh, and uh, Chairman Hominidy, uh, thank you for reminding me. I'm a new member of the Transportation HUD Appropriations Subcommittee, and I will take your suggestion, uh, your request uh, to heart. Uh, it's not always that I get asked to follow the House lead, uh, but uh, I appreciate you bringing that to my attention as well. Um, Mr. Orell uh, and Mr. Santa, last holiday season, uh, we experienced some significant uh, operational, really a, a meltdown uh, across the U.S. airspace. That was exacerbated by uh, no time system outage, uh, which we're working to solve uh, uh, with legislation as well. It led to thousands of uh, cancellations. What can I tell my constituents and, and Americans about what to expect uh, this holiday season with Thanksgiving approaching and, and uh, the, the winter holidays uh, just around the corner? Thank you, Senator. I can assure you that we have been working collaboratively with both labor and industry to address the issues that were highlighted during some of the more challenging times uh, last holiday season. Uh, of course, we had a, a significant weather event that was unprecedented in some ways with the uh, deep freeze that, that immediately followed uh, the snowstorm that had occurred. I just met recently this week with all of my counterparts across the airlines. They're in a much better position as far as their overall staffing, their operational control, and the amount of coordination they do with the FAA. Additionally, uh, while we're working to prioritize and train as many controllers, hire, train, and certify as many controllers as possible, while we have a long way to go, many of the facilities are much healthier than they were previously. And then we work collaboratively to the extent possible to have as many people in place to support those peak holiday periods. Once we were through the uh, Christmas and New Year uh, uh, holidays last year, the follow-on holiday travel periods where we see that peak in demand were much smoother, had much less uh, interruptions. We certainly had some challenging weather events uh, that uh, we don't expect traffic to fly through, but overall the recovery from each of those weather events, generally speaking, were one-day recoveries versus the multi-day type of recovery that you saw last year. Thank you. So we, we feel in a much better position than we did last year, and we're continuing to get better. Thank you for the question. I'm going to assume that the government doesn't shut down because that changes everything. I, ironically, I was sitting here thinking that's related to the shutdown. I, I was thinking it personally. I may need to be flying <laughs> because I can't get home before because of a shutdown during the holidays. So uh, this is not a personal question necessarily, but maybe. So I'm going to take the, uh, the actual aspects of our situation and not the... Uh, the changes in weather in the situation, because we are not healthier than we were last year, control-wise. I think FA's own numbers indicate we have potentially six more air traffic controllers than we had last year, system-wide. That is not uh, an expansive increase of what we need. Uh, we're at, if I can get the numbers here, our certified air traffic controller number right now is 10,721. Using their decade-old number, we should be at 13,097. And using the new collaborative resource work group number, we should be at 14,335. It's an unhealthy system that needs maximum hiring by the FA's own admission for 10 years to get us to the old number. 10 years of maximum hiring at the current throughput to get us to a 10-year-old number. At that point, it would be a 20-year-old staffing number in our facilities. What role does the, the size of the class and the capabilities of training and education in Oklahoma City at the Air Traffic Control Training Center, what role does that play in the 
lack of necessary air traffic controllers. I do admit, I think the capacity is right around 1,800, uh, potentially to 2,000. Tim and the FAA are working to try to increase that along with us, moving some of the ancillary things out of Oak City. Uh, but the more throughput we get, the more controllers that we can hire, the more success we will have sooner. We cannot uh, unqualify the standards or the professionalism or the expectation that when you certify in a facility, you're capable in doing this most challenging profession at the highest level. So challenging, uh, but more throughput is needed. Without changing the, the qualifications, there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's very helpful to increase the size uh, of the class. Absolutely. If we can increase the throughput without changing the qualifications, it's much needed. Thank you. Chairwoman Cantwell. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Captain Ambrosia, pilots uh, have rest requirements. Why is that? Because we need rest. We absolutely need rest. And, um, you know, out of the 2010 bill, there was a lot of reforms, not just pilot training, but uh, we went to a science-based fatigue, flight and duty time, rest rules um, uh, about eight, eight years ago. And it's been, it's been a success because now it's based on science, not some arbitrary number where uh, it limits our duty day instead of just flight time. But, you know, having an adequately rested pilot or controller or, or anyone that's a frontline worker is, is essential. Well, that's where I was going because to uh, your side there is the chair of the NTSB, and she's saying she's worried about their fatigue level. So as a captain, you're worried about the air traffic controller fatigue system? I think uh, Rich is probably better to, to comment on how their, their scheduling goes because I'm not an expert in, in air traffic control scheduling, but I can tell you as a pilot, uh, our rest is, is essential. So I would imagine it would be similar for them. Thank you. So I wanted to ask about this uh, also. Did you want to make a comment about that, Mr. Santa? Okay. Um, the air surface detection equipment model. One of the things that technology does do is it helps illuminate the risks, and certainly in a busy environment, and certainly one in which people are paying attention to lots of different things, the fact that it can be a more illuminating visual so that it's getting people's attention is also part of this system. Um, we have, in the Senate bill, increased the funding 18.2 billion over five years and an increase that would uh, put money to, as I said earlier, upgrade all the large and mid-size airports. I'm assuming all of you support uh, this investment, but if you could just give me a verbal yes. Yes, but we'd always also like technology in the cockpit of an airplane. The same technology you're saying? There are, is direct alerting technology to pilots uh, that can alert them that they're on the wrong one, runway, that they're on a taxiway, or that there's something in front of them. Okay, just down the line, if they support this language that's in the bill. Absolutely. Absolutely, thank you. Absolutely. Yes, Senator. Okay, so it takes, my understanding is it takes almost a year to get all this implemented, even if we got this bill passed right now. So I'm assuming, Chairwoman Hamidi, that you think this is something we should work with and dispatch to get this technology deployed as soon as possible. Absolutely. It has prevented uh, some, some almost accidents. And so we need the technology. Again, we need technology for uh, air traffic controllers, but we also need technology in the cockpit of airplanes. But the, the situational awareness, I think, Mr. Babbitt, back to the original next-gen days, the whole concept about next-gen is to digitize our system off of the radar system, but the whole aspect of it on the ground that would also give you situational awareness was one of the things trumpeted by the bill. And we can sit here all day and probably think about why we're in this situation of near misses. I think you've described it accurately. You're coming out of the COVID and re, uh, you know, ramping up in traffic. We have situations where we don't have the workforce that maybe we would would give us the rest time, but we knew we do know that we have technology solutions that if we just got them deployed, this would help. Well, and usually what I hear when I talk about technology is it's too expensive and we don't have the resources. We have to give the FAA the resources to invest. They need those resources. So we are strongly supportive of giving them the funding that they need to succeed at their jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Chairman Cantwell. Um, next to speak will be Senator Cinema, recognized for five minutes. She's via remote. We can move on to the uh, next senator who's waiting to speak and come back to Senator Cinema when she's available. Um, I also have uh, Senator Thune. Is he available? We're running all over the Capitol today, all of us in and out. So, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Now I can. Sen senator Cinema, you're recognized for five minutes. Wonderful. Thank you. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you to each of our witnesses for joining us today. Aviation safety is the FAA's mission, and I have long stated that the United States needs to remain the gold standard of aviation safety. To continue to set that gold standard, we need to continue to utilize all the tools available to us and hold hearings like this one to discuss opportunities to advance aviation safety. I appreciate the committee's emphasis on not simply maintaining safety, but innovating to improve our national airspace. The number of near misses makes it clear that now is the time to act to improve safety. It's unacceptable to wait for a tragedy to force us into action. We've heard a lot today about how essential simulator technology is for training air traffic controllers because it allows hands-on training for emergencies and unforeseen events without endangering actual aircraft. In fact, the FAA specifically called for updating simulator technology for air traffic controllers in response to recent near misses. We should all have the same desire to use the most advanced technologies to update our pilot training rules. And we should make sure that the 1500 hours of pilot training provides the best and most practical training available in order to maximize safety. Administrator Babbitt, you joined each of our other Senate confirmed FAA administrators since 1997 and two former ALPA presidents in a letter arguing that advanced flight simulator technology is required to ensure the best training outcomes. Your testimony today reiterates the need for training to evolve with technology. Can you explain why modern advanced flight simulators are essential to modern pilot training, including the unique ability to practice avoiding near misses and dealing with other emergencies? Well, thank you uh, for the question. <clears throat> and uh, yes, I, I, I think it's uh, incredibly important. Uh, I think what you have uh, in modern simulation today is the ability to recreate uh, or, or repeat events that have already happened, you can put people in situations that you would never put them in in a real airplane. You would not take an airplane into heavy icing conditions. You would not do the, but you can do things. You can simulate, for example, a clearance that uh, clearly was a conflict and you have to abort. Mm -hmm. uh, show the pilot how that happens. What happened? What went wrong? Uh, did anybody learn something from this? Let's not do it again. And, and those are the types of things uh, that immersive simulation can do. And we have the capacity to actually have controllers control airplanes on radar scopes and in simulators together so they can practice these things. And uh, I, I think it's a, a, a terrific advantage. I think it, it enhances safety greatly. Uh, if you've already seen a maneuver two or three times and know what, you've got, you know, what, what got you into it and how to properly get out of it, uh, I, I think that's a great benefit. Well, thank you. Mayor Ch Chair Hammondy, has the NTSB ever made a safety recommendation to the FAA based on a relationship between the exact number of hours spent flying an aircraft versus using other kinds of structured training programs? No, Senator, we have not. Thank you. Now, Chair Hammondy, do you agree with each of the former FAA administrators and Administrator Whitaker that based on your experience at the NTSB, incorporating the most advanced simulator technology into structured pilot training programs may play a role in improving safety outcomes. Yes, there is a role for technology. What doesn't exist is the safety data to show how much sim time and how much actual flying time is the right amount. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, Mr. Santa, as discussed here today, air traffic control is staffing is an integral component of our safety in our national airspace. I understand the FAA has the authority for direct hiring of individuals into in route and terminal facilities from FAA certified colleges and academies, such as Arizona State and Embry-Riddle Tech Universities. 
Now I could do this by reviving the collegiate training initiative or CTI program. You yourself went through the, went from the community college of Beaver County through CTI and were directly hired into a chronically understaffed facility. Do you think the FAA should establish a program like this to direct hire into facilities to supplement the staffing of our facilities across the country? Thank you for the question. It would certainly be valuable to increase the throughput and subsidize the academy. But as I said before, the standards can't be lessened by those schools and the uh, oversight needs to be um, maintained. Thank you. And my last question, Mr. Santa, today at most airports, controllers still use paper flight strips to keep track of flights. I've, I've actually seen it myself in Arizona. The FAA's Terminal Flight Data Manager Program, or TD, TFDM, is modernizing the system and will increase controller situational awareness to allow them to better handle fluctuations in traffic volume and changing weather. Unfortunately, due to budget constraints, the FAA recently reduced the number of airports that received this important technology from 89 down to 49, including removing four airports in my home state of Arizona. Could you talk about how TFDM reduces operational safety risk by increasing controllers heads up time and why controllers at all these airports will benefit from TFDM? It's not only uh, TFDM, but it's all modernization is stalled in every tool and in every um, implementation of new collaboratively determined technology helps our controllers uh, with separation, surface surveillance, uh, management of uh, traffic and capacity. And my, letter, my most recent data says it's down from 89 to 32 sites due to lack of funding. Uh, so it continues to attrit down due to lack of funding. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Sinema. I now recognize Senator Klobuchar for her five minutes. Um, thank you very much. Um, Thank you to all of you. Um, we have a, uh, I'm trying to get the video on here. There we go. Uh, we're in the middle of a big judiciary hearing, so I'm, I appreciate the ability to uh, ask some questions via video. Um, we have seen an alarming number of close call incidences on airport runways throughout the year. And these incidences are uh, preventable. We all know that because uh, we go gone for years without incidents like this. The NTSB has called for the expanded use of airport technologies to mitigate the risk. Um, I have an amendment to the FAA bill to direct the FAA to issue recommendations on cockpit alerting technologies that directly alert crews and pilots of potential incursions to prevent these near misses. How can equipping pilots with technology uh, prevent runway incursions and close calls? And I would ask that of you, Ms. Hamindi. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's a, one of our oldest recommendations going back to 23 years. I mean, the reason why you have cockpit alerting is if the uh, controller misses something. And if the controller misses something, then something can alert the pilots to take action. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. L, can you discuss why cockpit alerting systems are important and when we can expect a requirement from the FAA? Thank you, Senator. As an air traffic controller and within the air traffic organization, that would be outside our, our area of expertise or responsibility. I, can, I would defer to our, our, my colleagues in aviation safety on the regulatory side or, or anyone with the, the flight deck area of concern. Okay. Senator? Um, yes, if you could, and then I have to go into um, vote in this um, markup right now, and they need me there in person. So do you want a quick answer, and then I'll go in there? Oh, under, understood. We, this is the same thing we saw in 2007. There were a number of runway incursions, including in O'Hare and in Seattle, and then a terrible tragedy occurred, uh, and 49 out of 50 people on the plane died. At that point, we issued recommendations for technology. It's critical to save lives. Okay, very good. I appreciate that. And I'm gonna follow up in writing and thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Um, I do not have any other uh, senators in mind to uh, ask additional questions at this time. So we're gonna begin a second round of questions. Uh, I want to um, follow up the simulator discussion. There are already multiple ways to get to the ATP requirement 
uh, uh, under the 1500 hour rule. If you're a military pilot, you only need 750 hours because of the st very structured training you get as a military pilot and the use of full motion simulators. If you graduate from a four year aviation school, many of which are very good ones in Kansas, by the way, uh, uh, for, my, for my ranking member, um, then you only need 1,000 hours it, because of that good structured training and the simulators that are used. If you go to a two-year program uh, uh, and get an associate's degree in aviation, you only need 1,250 hours. Where we are right now is this discussion on the 1,500-hour rule is to, is there's a difference in opinion of what exactly is a simulator. You can't just say structured flight training in a simulator will qualify you one for one, uh, a zero sum game. Every hour you fly in a simulator, you can deduct an hour away from the 1500 hour rule. Especially if you don't define what type of simulator. Um, and, and that is the key thing because there's a hesitation to act because we know in industry, or at least in some carriers, they will fail to use simulator time effectively. Look no further than the Kogan incidents where they, they have simulators, but in the NTSB's accident report from the Kogan incident, it was found that Kogan company training did not have part of their training syllabus for tra simulator training at the time of the accident, procedures for how to uh, deal with the stick pusher system to overcome the icing condition, and they were never taught that, even though they had simulators. I think that if we're gonna talk about simulators, then we need to specifically say full motion uh, uh, full immersion, level D flight simulator. Mr. Ambrosi, rather than pitting simulator training against real world flight hours, would ELPA support FAA establishing additional simulator training hours requirements that would ensure all ATP certificate holders, in addition to earning at least 1,500 flying in an aircraft, gain a minimum level experience training in level D full flight simulators that are equipped with software capable of accurately recreating flight conditions for the most daunting in dire emergency situations? The short answer is yes, but if I may, Congress and through the FAA uh, 2010 bill has created the safest system out there. We have a 99.8% reduction as you indicated earlier. So also in that bill, Congress had the foresight to say, if technology comes along, there's a process to look through it, as was testified earlier. So there needs to be no change to legislation. We're, we're in the right place here. It's in all of the above. I completely agree with you on the level of stimulation. Our airline, there are industry today that are already trying to walk back that level of stimulation that you just discussed by saying maneuvers that were intended to be done in a full flight, six degree of motion simulator are now being performed in a level seven training device. So if airlines are already trying to save money by walking back what's already in that, I agree with your sentiment that we need to absolutely make sure that any simulator training is performed in the best simulators. Thank you, Mr. Babbitt, you're nodding. I'm gonna give you a chance to say something about it. Well, I, I agree completely. I, I think we have the technology today to uh, do all of the various things you've discussed. Uh, but I also would, would note for the record that there are uh, places where different types of simulation become uh, important. So, for example, the first day that you've, you've gotten out of ground school and you're going to go into flight training, do you need to sit in a $17 million simulator to figure out what the switches nope. are? No, you don't. You can sit in the stationary device and learn. Uh, does that count the same? No, it does not. Uh, but I, 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 I would add that it is helpful. But uh, later simulation, I do think, and the arcs that we have seen, both of them have curriculums that uh, discuss the maneuvers and the quality of the simulation, and I, it's spelled out. And I agree with Captain Ambrosi. That it's, it's right in front of us. We just need to adopt it. It is. And, and the thing with, with those lower level of flight simulators, they're appropriate for certain types of training. When I, after I was wounded and I was working towards getting my private pilot's license, even though I was a commercial uh, helicopter pilot, I had to learn to land, do takeoffs and landings um, I fly with just my one left prosthesis on, I don't wear a right leg, and I had to learn crosswind landings, and we did that in the Redbird simulator, right? right. Um, very you know, uh, lower technology until I got good with it, proficient with it, mm -hmm. but none of that time counted towards the minimum amount of time that I would need. We don't, dis we don't subtract that time. Right. That is in addition. That's why I, you know, I proposed the Experienced Pilots Safe Lives Act, and, and my bill would actually build on being more clear about what type of training you need before you become a first officer with an ATP. So for example, I think we need 900 hours of cross-country flight time. 200 hours of that should be 
uh, 200 hours total should be night flight time, 375 hours of flight time in the class of airplane for which you're seeking your rating, 75 hours of instrument flight time in actual IMC, 200 hours of cross-country flight time in an airplane as a pilot in command or a second in command performing the duties of PIC while under the supervision of a PIC, 50 hours of night flight time. We want pilots to have actual flight time experience that is relevant. We don't want them in a 152 burning hose in the sky, but you don't want to do that in a simulator either. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of the discussion we have to have here is how do we get to 1,500 hours? How do we get to that first officer's seat in, in that commercial airliner, whether it is a regional jet or 737 or whatever that is, mm -hmm. and we have to do that in a way that we put forward the best, safest pilots possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I am concerned that we're doing a one-for-one -one swap without clearly stating, a one-for-one -one swap in that 1,500 hours, without clearly stating exactly what type of simulator is being used and what type of training is being used. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, Scott Cambrosi, uh, Mr. Babu, would you associate yourself with, with my assessment there, that it's important to be specific as to what type of simulator? And I, can, I can tell you from industry, if training. you don't, or if you are not specific, they will go to the minimum. So we absolutely need to spell out exactly what needs to be done and what level of simulation and what structure needs to be to any training that you're referring. Because if not, if you leave it nebulous and ambivalent, X credit for who knows what, they will make it a race to the bottom. And I would agree. I think you may you have to be crystal clear uh, on, on the quality of the simulation gets you so much. And as I mentioned earlier, the ARCs have defined some of the... But I think one of the things that everybody should remember with simulation you're teaching a technique. Yes. This is how you do this, and you can do it without danger. And if you make a mistake, okay, so the simulator crashes, but nobody gets hurt. Yes. But you won't do it again. And, and so it's a technique training, and I think that you can't use that completely to say, well, that's all the flight time I need. No, that's not accurate either. But it's a great training tool. It's a great exposure. You've seen these things before. You've seen it in simulation. So you're prepared for it when it happens. Uh, early pilot told me a long time ago, Good pilots never surprise pilot. So. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Babbitt. I'm going to indulge uh, and further. I'm going to give you extra time, Mr. Moran, um, uh, Mrs. Santa. I want to get back to this uh, crew rest idea. We we understand uh, and base uh, uh, air crew rests on scientific methods, as, as Captain Brosi has uh, mentioned, and that's really important. I remember um, when I was at Walter Reed, my one of my first surgeries for which I was conscious, I was going to go into surgery for, um, uh, was going to be a 14-hour surgery, and my surgeon came up to me just as they were putting the, uh, uh, the, the anesthetic into me that would put me under and said, I've been planning this all week. I know exactly what I'm going to do. It's going to be 14 to 18 hour surgery. We're going to take care of you. You're going to be great. I've been up all night thinking about this. And just as I was about to go to sleep, the last thing I remember saying to him was like, did you get any sleep, doc? Because I would feel better knowing that you'd gotten some sleep. And, and so I, I want Mr. Santa to give you time to talk about this rest issue, because I do believe that we've gone to a point with air traffic controllers because there's such staffing shortages, because there's such demand that we're going with the minimum rest required in order to um, give someone before they show up for work the next day. And that minimum should not become the standard. Uh, thank you for the time. I, I just want to clarify a few things. Our schedules are uh, in accordance with the orders to allow enough crew rest. It's the expansion of 10-hour 10 uh, 10 days and six-day work weeks that really exasperates the fatigue and introduces potential risks. Uh, with a fully functioning uh, and fully staffed air traffic control facility, that would be lessened. Uh, the FA's uh, chronic statement is we can get more productivity out of our controllers and we need to change the schedules of our controllers. No, the answer is not continuing to burden us with more fatigue and continuing to, uh, to, to burden us with more effort and work. It's hiring the right amount of controllers so that our facilities are not 70 and 60 and 80 percent staffed. It's untenable and it needs to be corrected through hiring and, and, and not changing the standards. Thank you. Senator Cruz is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, with Mr. Errol. Uh, for the past decade, the FAA has met or nearly met its hiring goal for air traffic controllers. This year, the FAA hired 1,500 future controllers to go through the ATC Academy. 
Next year, that number will be 1,800. But 30% are likely to wash out. Add in retirements and other constraints. And how many controllers will we, will we be at next year? Thank you, Senator. Uh, could you repeat the question, how many controllers total we have or higher? I just want to yeah, how, how many will we, we be at next year? Uh, as we continue certified controllers, we expect to be over 11,000 certified controllers uh, making our way up. We intend to continue to hire at our maximum current rate of 1,800 or slightly better uh, in the near future. So at this rate, it would take years for the FAA to hire enough controllers to meet the need, especially given that it is a multi-year process from initial hiring to becoming a fully certified controller. Would an additional ATC controller training facility help boost capacity and improve retention and performance of the workforce? Senator, one of the challenges that we have, or the greatest challenge, is not the physical space or the amount of the academy. It's the number of retired controllers, either military or FAA, that can, are available to provide instruction and are willing to locate to where the region where the academy may be. Some of the strategies that we're trying to explore is uh, augmenting the training in our current Oklahoma City Academy for ra upper radar classes out to other federal facilities and freeing up those that finite number of instructors that are available to provide that instruction to focus on new hires at the academy. So it's a delicate balance of trying to find the right qualified people to provide that training. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Humandy, thank you for being here today and staying on the subject of air traffic controllers. An OIG report says 77% of critical ATC facilities are understaffed with New York terminal radar approach control at 54%. Given that a majority of the critical ATC facilities are understaffed, are you concerned about the impact of that on safety of the airspace? Absolutely. I'm happy to continue. Please. Okay. <laughs> I just yes. wanted yes. want to be respectful of your I... time. Um, absolutely, I am worried about safety. What's happening from the staffing shortage is that uh, air traffic controllers are being uh, required to do mandatory overtime. And what happens with mandatory overtime? Uh, you, uh, it ends up leading to fatigue and distraction, which is exactly what we're seeing as part of these incident investigations. And uh, it all just comes down to the shortage of staffing. You recently said that, quote, the FAA system for certifying pilots and mechanics hasn't kept up with the science around mental health let alone modern attitudes, and called it a, an open secret that current rules uh, incentivize uh, pilots to lie about their mental health history or avoid seeking health. Yesterday, I sent you a letter exp expressing my concern about this issue and asking what safety changes should be made. Um, does the FAA and the NTSB have a full understanding of how pervasive pilot mental health issues are? If we just took CDC numbers of one in five U.S. adults live with a mental health challenge, that's about 58 million Americans, and then we look at FAA's civil airmen statistics, which show that there are about 757,000 pilots, including students, recreational, sport, then you're looking at about 114,000 to 151,000 pilots that have mental health challenges. People are suffering in silence. Captain Ambrosi, it's very concerning that ALPA and the FAA refused to comply with the National Academy study that Congress asked for in the 2018 FAA reauthorization. It is Congress's job to provide oversight of federal programs and both the FAA and ALPA deliberately stood in the way of that by refusing to provide data owned by the federal government needed for the report. And I would urge ALPA to reconsider your refusal to cooperate. Turning to a question. In October, an Alaska Airlines pilot tried to cra crash an airplane. The pilot has claimed to have been suffering from mental issues and had taken psychedelic mushrooms in the days prior to the incident. Do you know when the Alaska Airlines pilot was last drug tested? I do not. Does ALPA support additional drug testing requirements for pilots to make sure that they haven't been abusing substances before they fly? 
the uh, ongoing drug testing program is reviewed regularly. Uh, I'm not an, an expert on the drug testing program, but pilots are the high, one of the highest scrutinized uh, professions out there. We go through regular drug testing, regular ch checks in training, uh, line checks, line observations. So uh, an extremely rare incident is this. I share your outrage at this specific incident. However, uh, you know, it's, it, it calls for a, a panel to discuss mental health is what, it, what we should do. So why did ALPA refuse to cooperate with the National Academy study that Congress had mandated? So uh, I think the HIMSS program is being conflated with, with pilot mental health. The HIMSS program is a occupational substance abuse uh, and treatment program, and we actually did cooperate with, with the Academy. However, as the study notes, ALPA is not the owner of that database. So I, I received your letter yesterday. I'm happy to do more uh, research on it and, and reply with, uh, in writing and meet with your team to discuss further by the deadline. Thank you, I appreciate that. Senator Thune. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me just start by saying that the wider use of new technologies has and will continue to improve ATC and airport situational awareness. And I also see technology playing a crucial role in training more well-rounded and well-prepared airline pilots. As the number of incidents increases, the last thing this committee should do is remain complacent, which is why Senator Sinema and I offered an amendment to the Senate FAA reauthorization codifying the recommendations of the Air Carrier Training ARC to create a two-month enhanced qualification program. This detailed course of instruction paired with advanced simulator training from seasoned airline pilots would expose trainees to the cockpits of the jets that they would actually be flying and importantly, allow them to experience what it's like to handle challenging and dangerous situations in those cockpits. Mr. Babbitt, your uh, bipartisan letter calling on Congress to expand the use of simulator training stated that, and I quote, requiring the repeated practice of the prevention of and recovery from myriad real-world accident scenarios in full motion flight simulators will make better pilots, end quote. Could uh, you elaborate on why the use of new simulator technologies is so crucial to training well-rounded pilots? Sure, and thank you for, uh, for the question. <clears throat> I think the ability we have today with the modern simulation uh, exposes pilots uh, to situations that they, you simply wouldn't put them in. Uh, we killed a number of, of pilots in the past, uh, accidents, practicing engine failures on takeoff in real airplanes. If it didn't go well, they died. And we learned from that, and we've now created uh, scenarios. The other thing uh, I think we get in the, uh, in the simulation world is the ability to put people in an environment, and I don't just mean in the airplane environment, I mean in the cockpit environment. You have 1,500 hours, is any of that with, a, with another pilot? Are you always just a pilot in command? And the answer, you could be. Well, that's not what you're gonna do when you go over to work as a commercial airline pilot. You're gonna be in a crew situation. You need to understand uh, crew resource management. You need to know what happens when the captain is suggesting something that you don't think is operationally correct. Do you, have you learned how to deal with that? You do in a simulator. And so I think all of these lead us to much better train. They've, they've been exposed to many things that you simply won't get exposed to. Are you gonna fly your light airplane into a heavy thunderstorm and, and hail? No, you're not, uh, not twice. Uh, so, uh, you know, these do put us in situations where you can learn from it. You, well, wow, we'll never do that again. I see what happened. Uh, I, I'll give it my, myself as an example. In 1981, there was a, a tragic accident in Windshear in Dallas-Fort Worth. Every airline pilot in this country had to go get an hour in the simulator because uh, Airbus, Boeing, and the FAA together changed the technique to recover from stalls. Every pilot in this country had to go get an hour in the simulator, and I remember mine. They said, just shoot the approach and recover just like you knew how to do. And we did, and we crashed. And they said, now we're going to use the new technique. We learned it. And it was great exposure. And we've learned so much. Uh, wind shear is not the problem that it was back then. So I, I think simulation adds a huge layer of, of learning and expertise and coordination to the system and safety. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holmandy, I fully recognize the value of cockpit experience. And I see time in real aircraft as an essential part of training airline pilots. Or I'm concerned that the rote accumulation uh, as Mr. Babbitt has noted, of flight hours doesn't provide trainees with adequate exposure to commercial aircraft or prepare them for the uh, unexpected, potentially dangerous scenarios. Do you see a role for the enhanced use of new technologies, including advanced 
full flight simulators to improve exposure of prospective airline pilots to scenarios that they couldn't otherwise encounter in real aircraft? Yes, there is always a role for simulators as part of training. Uh, but the most realistic scenario-based training so that uh, pilots become proficient. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just, uh, if I could, uh, Mr. Errol, um, during my time as chairman of the, this committee, we considered and enacted the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 and included prioritization of next-gen upgrades to bolster the nation's air traffic control system. These upgrades, in addition to employing concepts such as dynamic airspace management, will allow the United States to better utilize existing infrastructure, increasing the capacity and efficiency of the NAS. Recent ATC issues at airports across the country have certainly highlighted the need for modernization. From your perspective, um, what technology upgrade should be prioritized to avoid preventable incidents like those we've seen around the country? Thank you, Senator. Anything that it helps to increase situational awareness for everyone involved uh, is, is a great technology improvement. And the agency is in the process of uh, doing a technology sprint, launching uh, three areas of technology, one around approach runway verification, which will be or is available in all of our approach control uh, automation systems now and can be programmed locally to detect wrong surface landing. There's the runway incursion device uh, that it will be deployed in the next year to year and a half at over 70 towers to provide an audible and visual alarm to controllers uh, if they were to clear someone for takeoff or landing on a runway that had been released for another activity. And then lastly, a surface awareness initiative that we've kicked off for a rapid acquisition and uh, hope to have in place at our first facility by June of 24 for commercially available services that provide situational awareness sim similar to what a, any pilot can bring into their into their aircraft now with an iPad and, and they have good situational awareness of aircraft operating around. So anything that increases the sharing and real-time exchange of data between aircraft operators and air traffic controllers and provide that common situational awareness as well as safety logic is all, all helpful. Thank you. And my, Madam Chair, my time has expired, but I have some additional questions I'd like to submit for the record. Thank you. Without objection. Senator Hinkerlooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I thank all of you for being here. This certainly is a timely uh, opportunity to uh, make sure that we get not just senators educated, but uh, the broader population of our country and the world. Um, Mr. Arrow, let me start with you. Um, the cost to build a traditional air traffic control tower can reach up to $20 million. Um, for airports serving rural communities, this can be a real impediment. Um, in Colorado, we have the Northern Colorado Regional Airport, which is actually uh, going out uh, and trying to you know, build their own tower to attract new and reliable air service um, from airlines by making sure that they, they do install a remote tower project. So if approved by the FAA, this will, without question, grow the local economy. Um, it's important for the FAA safely, that it's important that the FAA safely integrates leading edge technology into our aviation system. So my, my question is, what is the FAA doing to spur innovation and safety in, in these regional airports that really do play such a big role, um, such as Northern Colorado um, Airport, uh, in in uh, pursuing re remote tower projects. Thank you, Senator. My organization works closely with our next gen organization as they explore remote tower technology and certainly there, there's an opportunity there and, so, and some promise. The initial technology that's been evaluated to date did have some shortfalls. I can tell you as a former controller, what we wanna make sure is that the system works, that it's reliable, uh, and that it provides that level, that equivalent level of safety that we see in, in a staff tower. Uh, there is, again, some promise. We're continuing to do that work next gen. Our next gen office is bringing uh, additional technology into our tech center in New Jersey where we're allowing vendors to bring in uh, that technology, demonstrate it, build that level of trust prior to us issuing a certification that it, it meets that same standard as our staff towers. Great. That's a, I mean, anything I say, I've, I've, I've heard this, we are watching part of this from the office, the safety first is what pretty much the mantra that I expect in what we've been hearing. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Hamandi, uh, these recent runway near misses, these incidents of, uh, of, of close to cata catastrophic proportions have seemed to be increasing at, at an alarming rate. Um, 
uh, in September, DIA, Denver International Airport, sorry, uh, opened a new taxiway that hopefully is going to eliminate a, what they call a hot spot, um, where aircraft volume uh, has increased risks of unintended uh, or not unintended, but all, un all or of air, air, airspace collisions. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law continues to make strategic investments to improve airfield lighting, to modernize runways, uh, taxi infrastructure, improve safety. Which effective project designs, which best practices um, does the N NTSB recommend that airports should implement following these uh, recent runway safety meetings um, that, you know, I assume this is happening nationwide. We don't have any current recommendations on that. I think we may have past recommendations that we've closed, and I'm happy to give those to you. Great. But I think it is obviously a national issue, and the, I think the more ways we can look at it, the, the more successful we'll be. Um, Mr. Ambrosi, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, estimates that there will be a 13% increase in the need for pilots by 2030. Uh, some people think that might be conservative. Um, obviously, aviation is a key part of our economy. Job growth also affects a lot of other components and elements of our economy. Um, among the many pathways available for an aspiring student to become a certified pilot, airlines are also establishing dedicated academies. United Airlines, Airlines has their Aviate Academy to uh, further increase the, the training available to, to young pilots. Obviously, I think this increases safety. Uh, in Denver, we have Metropolitan State University, um, which is the first university in Colorado to uh, be accredited by the FAA to offer curriculum to aspiring pal pilots um, so that they can achieve a restricted air transport uh, pilot certificate. Um, and MSU is partnering with a number of affiliate flight schools in the, in the communities in the greater metropolitan area. Uh, would you describe the impact, or how would you describe, or could you describe, I know you can, could you describe the impact that accredited university programs like MSUs uh, in Denver, uh, that they have on, the, the grow, on growing the pipeline of, of uh, trained pilots? Uh, absolutely, thank you for the question. Uh, as you know, there's, there's more than one pathway to getting that ATP. And having an academic program such as that, you know, a two-year degree gets you a, a 250-hour reduction, a four-year degree gets you a 500-hour reduction, gets you that RATP, as you mentioned. That's because of advanced academics. So these pilots are learning more. They're, they're getting these advanced academics, which is a credit towards, towards the program. So it's, it's a very good pipeline. The aviation schools such as that, are the pipeline's full. It's good to be a pilot right now, and, and, and people are coming to these schools in, in, in rapid fashion to be part of, this, part of this occupation. So it's an essential part of what, what we do to get pilots in the pipeline. Great. Yeah. I, I, I was very impressed. We went, went through it and looked at what they were doing, and it was a, a great source of optimism. So anyway, thank you all for all the work you're doing to keep the, the skies safe. I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, the incredibly patient Senator Markey. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks you for holding this incredibly important uh, hearing. Um, <clears throat> I share my colleagues' serious concerns about the recent series of near-miss incidents which have impacted my home state of Massachusetts as well. In late February, two planes nearly collided at Boston Logan Airport when one attempted to take off as another one was landing. And in March, the wings of two United Airlines planes clipped each other at Logan. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt in these incidents, but passengers and flight crews are understand understandably worried about the safety of U.S. air travel. So, uh, Chair uh, Hamandi, uh, I understand that the National Transportation Safety Board investigated the near miss at Logan from February. Can you provide an update on that investigation? Yes, we, rep we issued a final report on that uh, investigation, and the HAPA flight uh, pilot uh, heard, um, thought, he, thought he heard that he could go forward. He was told to line up and wait, uh, but he began his takeoff role and um, said that, uh, reported to us that he was uh, not feeling well that day, and um, that possibly he was experiencing some things from the cold weather in Boston. 
Um, and, and how do you correct that with that pilot? He, he misheard an instruction? Yeah, I mean, there, there has been a lot of fatigue, distraction, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pilots mishearing instructions uh, in all the investigations that we're conducting. I mean, the one thing that's good at, at your airport is you have ASDX. It's not the same in other airports. I see. And what does that mean? What's that addition? So ASDX alerts the controllers that there's an impending collision and can take action to prevent it. Yeah. Should that be mandatory at all airports? I think it should be mandatory at the most, uh, uh, at least medium or large-sized airports. But right is now, that it's that is that what saved us at Logan? Yeah. Yeah. So that I takes resources for the FAA. We need robust funding for the FAA. <clears throat> Sustainable funding. Right. Yeah, but again, like when you drive in a car, if the driver makes a mistake, the airbag is still there as the backup. Exactly. It so, provides the safety net. And that's what FTX is. It's, that's right. It's the airbag. It's the extra safety measure where there has been operator uh, error. Um, so I think that's something that we should absolutely be talking about. And I'm glad, again, I'm, I'm glad that NTSB is investigating these uh, incidents. Now I'd like to turn to another threat to aviation safety, climate change, from increased turbulence in the sky to flooded runways. Climate change is already having serious consequences for our aviation system. Coastal airports, like in my home state of Massachusetts, are especially threatened by ocean level rise. Uh, our, our airport is just on landfill in Boston Harbor, which is the second fastest warming body of water on Earth. That's how fast it's all warming there. As a Brookings report declared earlier this year, America's airports aren't ready for climate change. If we don't invest in climate resilience at our airports, we are in for a bumpy ride. To each of our witnesses, starting with Chairman Holmanday, do you agree that climate change is a significant threat to aviation safety? I am not a climate change expert, but I agree. Cap Captain. Uh, yes, yeah, so I would agree I'm not a climate change expert, but we, we completely agree, and pilots do a lot to try to minimize carbon emissions, also noise, so we're, we're an active participant in reducing greenhouse gases in the aviation profession. Great, thank you. As an air traffic controller, it's really not impacted us at all. Um, so personally, I believe that climate change has an impact, but as an air traffic controller, I can't say yes. Thank you. Yes, I think you're seeing uh, more violent weather which is not helpful. Also, the uh, slowly rising temperatures, uh, aircraft, uh, a lot of people aren't aware, but as the temperature gets higher and higher, the aircraft needs longer runways. Thank and you. so you're, you're pushing the envelope there as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we certainly have seen a significant increase in severe weather throughout this last summer season, and we would uh, we, we join you in supporting everything we can do to minimize the impacts of that. Thank you. And, that, and that's why I filed legislation with Senator Sullivan, the airport Infrastructure Resiliency Act, bipartisan. We can see it's coming. We need to actually have uh, more protection and another piece of legislation, Airline Operational Resiliency Act with Senators Fisher and Welsh and Capito aim to uh, improve the overall resiliency. And finally, um, today's hearing would be incomplete if we didn't discuss the role that airport service workers play in keeping our airports safe baggage handlers, wheelchair attendants, gate attendants, other workers play an essential role in our aviation system. And by providing airport service workers a living wage and benefits, we ensure that airports have a well-trained and experienced workforce to identify security incidents and respond to emergency situations. When we shortchange airport service workers, we leave our airports and passengers vulnerable. Earlier this morning, I rallied with airport service workers, uh, SEIU, uh, and called on Congress to pass the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act. Um, and that will ensure that these workers, these hidden figures at the airport who ensure that the planes can take off every day and safely get fair wages, health care benefits, um, sick time, which they're not getting right now. And uh, we have to make sure that all this federal money that we send to airports actually gets distributed in a way that's a lot more fair. We saw how hard they worked during the pandemic. We saw the risks that they took for their health and their families in order to make the rest of us safe at those airports. And we just have to rectify that historic um, imbalance in terms of 
how much the airlines are profiting by the billions and how much these workers are still being left behind without the benefits they deserve. So I just want to raise that one, one, once again. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for your great leadership. Thank you, Senator Markey. Um, as we've heard today, there are many things that we can do to improve uh, uh, the safety of our aviation system in this country, which is the global leader in safety when it comes to commercial aviation operations. Um, today's hearing demonstrates that we must address the serious near misses we've seen recently with the utmost sense of urgency and to prevent future incidents. We've dealt with everything from uh, 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 workforce shortages for air traffic controllers to pilots uh, to maintenance workers. Um, and, and the pending FAA reauthorization legislation addresses this. Uh, in in con, um, uh, partnership with my ranking member, um, uh, we have tripled the funding in this FAA reauthorization bill for pilots, for maintenance workers, for air traffic controllers, all of those programs. Um, in the midst of this serious discussion, reducing the amount of aeronautical experience for pilots is the wrong idea at the wrong time. And I just want to reiterate the history of the 1500 hour rule. It came about post Colgan crash. And Congress went to the airlines and said, what is the minimum number of flight hours that is needed? And it was the airlines who came back and said 1500 hours. This number was reached through consultation with the commercial air carriers who came back and said that is what is required. And that level has kept us safe, has kept the flying public safe in the years since. Um, there are already multiple ways to become a commercial airline first officer, there are multiple ways already to get that ATP. Not every pilot that ends up in a commercial airline as a first officer has 1,500 hours. You can be an airline, you can become a military pilot, 750 hours. You can go to a four-year aeronautical program with a very structured training program, very rigorous program, you can do 1,000 hours. You can attend at any one of our great two-year uh, uh, programs. We have many of those in Illinois, very proud of them. 1,250 hours. And then for those who don't go through any of those formal programs, who just go down to the local FBO and start learning to fly, and that is a very legitimate, valid way to work your way in, it's 1,500 hours. Uh, um, rather than watering down existing safety standards, we must always be looking to enhance aviation safety. Today we've discussed the fact that a simulator is not a simulator is not a simulator. Uh, um, uh, uh, we, can o we cannot forget that the United States can only lead in aviation if it leads to aviation, if it leads in aviation safety. And again, uh, um, if we're going to be talking about simulators, we need to be clear what type of simulator we're talking about. Because as Captain Ambrosi says, if you just say structured training and don't define what that simulator is, there will be a race to the bottom by the airlines to go with the lowest level simulator, the cheapest level simulator possible. And that is not going to be beneficial to the flying public. With Administrator Whitaker at the helm, uh, and he has strong tailwinds with an almost unanimous 98 to 0 confirmation vote, uh, the FAA already has the legal authority, the expertise, and the discretion to issue standards on pilot training and qualifications. You can already do that. In fact, FAA's Aviation Rulemaking Committee is already looking at whether it is appropriate to create yet another pathway to becoming an airline pilot first officer with fewer than 1,500 hours. Um, again, we have the four-year program, 1250, I'm um, 1,000 hours, two-year program, 1250, military pilots, 750, and the FAA is already looking and already has the authority to create yet another pathway. Um, we have an administrator, we have safety experts at FAA and a process to study this issue to see if changes are required. And if they are, the FAA can certainly act on that. I believe that we do not need any legislative change that could lower that safety bar if you're going to use language such as structured simulator training without defining what that simulator is. Um, I don't think that preemptively reducing the 1,500 hours that was, um, uh, uh, that was recommended by the airlines and has resulted in over 10 years of safe aviation operations is the way to go. Now, if you're going to do that, again, then we need to say, hey, if you're going to gain a minimum level experience in a flight simulator, that needs to be a level D full flight simulator equipped with software capable of accurately recreating flight conditions for the most daunting and dire emergency operations. Um, you know, there, there, there are simulators for surgeons as well who can practice uh, different surgeries without actually having to do it on the patient first. But I, but I will um, uh, uh, paraphrase Captain Sullenberger who said, you know, if we, don't ha if we have a doctor shortage and we have a surgeon shortage, 
the solution isn't to say, let's make medical school two years. The solution isn't to say, let's just have surgeons only do training on a surgery simulator and they don't actually have to operate on patients. That's not the solution. I don't think this is the either extreme end. I'm just saying that if we're going to put in simulators and we're going to reduce the flying hour requirements for uh, um, that first officer, then let's be clear about what we're substituting it with. And let's be precise about what we're substituting it with. Let's have a curriculum for what that is going to be. Again, you can fly hose in the sky in a simulator just as well as you can fly hose in the sky in a 152. Um, I want to thank our witnesses for your participation today. The hearing record will remain open for four weeks until December 7th, 2023. Um, any senator that would like to submit questions for the record should do so two weeks from now by November 23rd. We ask that responses be returned to the committee by December 7th, 2023. And that concludes today's hearing. Thank you, everyone.